you're welcome to use the chat box throughout the webinar to communicate with the other participants. But if you want to ask a question of the panelists, please use the Q&A panel. So you can find that down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's the chat or the Q&A. And Q&A, we will be monitoring specifically for questions of uh, the panelists. And I'll try and uh, make time for everybody, to, uh, if you have questions, for the panelists to be able to answer those. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sierra Club BC is an environmental charity that recently celebrated its 50th anniversary, and we acknowledge our accountability to learning from past mistakes. Uh, and I invite you to read our statement of accountability, which is on our website, and maybe Flossie can pop this into the chat, but uh, we have a document called Balancing the Canoe that I invite you to read. Under the leadership of our executive director, Hannah Askew, we are working to fill the vision of a healthy, life-sustaining planet where humans respect the dignity and interdependence of all beings. And I'd like to gratefully acknowledge our partners for this evening, the Couch and Public Art Gallery, which is a relatively new organization. The Couch and Public Art Gallery Society's intention is to be a public art institution committed to developing connections between art and communities. Its exhibits are intended to provoke intellectual inquiry, capture visitors' imaginations, and encourage debate and discussion. They are also committed to fostering dialogue between artists, both local and uh, international. And a special shout out to their curator, Wendy Robeson, and to my mom, Becky Hazel, for helping to get this event off the ground. There were countless hours uh, done in the back, and we're really, really grateful that this is coming together, especially because the pandemic threw some wrenches and this is a bumpy road, so thanks for your work. Uh, this event is part in a series of the Forest Breath of, of Life theme, and the first was a youth art, art exhibit, which was featured online. The second is a physical current exhibit, which is located at the Cowichan Community Center, and that's on display until August 24th at the uh, Cowichan Valley Arts Council space in the Cowichan Community Center on James Street, um, formerly known as the Island Saving Center. So. Uh, if you have the chance, please do go and check out the pieces that are on display now. Forest Breath of Life explores a, the multifaceted nature of forests as home to a vast number of flora and fauna, as a source of beauty, healing, and solace to humans, as a resource which we harvest, and as an ecosystem under threat, and as the source of every breath we take. Uh, you can also, if you can't make it to the gallery, you can check it out online at cowichandgallery.ca slash exhibitions. So uh, that's enough for me. <laughs> Let's introduce the panelists. So um, first we have joining us uh, Karen Yip, who is an 18 year old climate justice activist and regional coordinator with the Sustainability Teams, the Lower Mainland's Youth Climate Activist Group. She's a settler on stolen and unceded land of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh nations known, colo uh, colonially known as Burnaby. She is driven by the necessity for a just sustainable future and a fascination with the power of storytelling. This September, Kieran will be living in Ottawa and attending Carleton University's Global and International Studies program with a specialization in communications and media. Glad to have you here, Kieran, welcome. Randy Cook uh, next, who hold, holds the title of Makwala in the Mamtabkila clan of the Kwakwala speaking people, holds the responsibility to speak for his family. He's a recent graduate of the Masters of Fine Arts program at the University of Victoria. Randy has been on a path of exploring many art forms and developed a newfound passion while creating his own signature style. His exploration is about connecting culture and ecology, and he discovers a beautiful symbiotic relationship, capturing its very essence in new mediums. I'm really excited to uh, hear tonight about his latest project, uh, the Tree of Life Project. We, we will get a little sneak preview of that. Welcome, Randy. Uh, next, we have Kyle Sherman. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Kyle. Great. Um, and he's a painter and recent participant in Eden Grove Artist in Residence program. He holds a Master's of Fine Arts from Emily Carr University and is a two-time recipient of the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation Painting Award. Sherman's practice is contingent on extensive travel, relying on experiential research of the Earth's diverse ecosystems and interdisciplinary co collaborations with musicians and poets. Sherman has had recent solo exhibitions at the Angel Gallery in Toronto. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that one right either, Angel, um, and the Elisa Crystal Gallery in Vancouver. And I believe that one of your works is also on display at the Fortune Gallery in Chinatown as part of the Eden. Yeah, awesome. So if you get a chance to 
go to the Fortune Gallery in Chinatown in Victoria, you'll be able to see one of Kyle's paintings as well. And so glad to have you here uh, from Ontario, Kyle. So uh, let's get started with Kieran. I'm gonna quickly, before I ask you some questions, Kieran, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can you guys see that? Does that look okay? Great, so let's, I've already done that part. I've already skipped all of these slides. Okay, here we go. So I just wanted to share really quickly, this is um, a couple of images from the Sustainability Teens Instagram account. The Sustainability Teens are top notch with social media. They are knocking it out of the park. They have more followers than Sierra Club BC on Instagram. And if you don't already follow them, I highly encourage you to do so full of really interesting information and they're really solid on the use of visual imagery um, to promote the concepts of climate justice. So here we have a couple of photos of Karen and I'd love to, um, yeah, ask you to talk a little bit about um, your work with the sustainability teams, uh, what you do there and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for having me um, and to everyone who's helped organize this. This is, um, I'm, yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Um, yeah, so for the past almost two years now, um, I've been working with the Sustainability Teens. Um, so we, uh, so the Sustainability Teens has, uh, has its roots in um, climate, the climate strike movement that um, Greta Thunberg kind of spearheaded across the world. Um, and so I think it was September 2019 um, that there was this massive climate strike in Vancouver with 100,000-ish, possibly more people um, attending. And that was um, the sort of the first big event that the sustainability teams put on. Um, and since then, we've been... I, so then I joined that next, uh, the following spring, um, which was March 2020. Um, and since then, we've been just sort of figuring out how activism works in a sort of, you know, post-pandemic, whatever this, this new world we're in is. Um, and my role specifically, um, when, I, when I joined the organization, um, sort of like as I got going, I, I became the uh, regional coordinator for Burnaby New West and the Tri-Cities. And so we have a group of sort of like 15 to 30 people depending on the and depending on the week um in that area um and we um work on uh we've sort of done strikes do you said decentralized strikes um during the pandemic where we had sort of different regions um so there's the region that i coordinate and then there's um, three other regions throughout the lower mainland um and so we've been doing work like that we've focused on a lot of things from um uh, well, from this this mural that you can see here is a mural painting that we did um, just this uh, June. Yeah, that was June um, uh, in front of the Chubb Insurance uh, buildings in downtown Vancouver um, against uh, the Chubb Insurance Company's insuring of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, um, which is, you know, insuring that the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline is a is a massive climate disaster um, that's still being pushed through by the government and um, been, being helped by these um, insurance companies. Um, but yeah, so we've done all, we do a lot of work. We've done everything from helping to get um, a city councillor in Burnaby um, elected, um, Alison Gu. Uh, so she's really awesome. Um, uh, and to uh, the Vancouver sort of more central branch uh, worked on getting the Vancouver Climate Emergency Action Plan passed um, a while ago. We just kind of tend, we, we end up sort of following wherever the sort of the need is for, um, climate work in Vancouver and and we try to use our voice as youth um, because it can be quite powerful to, to hear from youth often we kind of get that like factor of oh look at the children aren't they so wonderful and that can be <laughs> pretty useful sometimes um, and, and something that we've been working on a lot recently and sort of grappling with um, within our organization is the fact that the climate movement hasn't always been very um, intersectional um, I think something that Sierra Club, Club has been dealing with, of course, because of um, the Sierra Club's history, um, but also for us, um, it's a movement that sort of has been, like the youth climate movement has been born out of like, um, it's been traditionally a very sort of whitewashed movement and we're sort of learning to understand the intersectionality of climate and um, we are, you know, we stand in solidarity with the Indigenous nations on whose land we do our work and, and um, so we've been doing a lot of learning about that recently and yeah, I think we're we're just sort of 
there's a federal election coming. We're going to be working on that. There's a lot of stuff going on right now, and we're just sort of in a transitional period still as we sort of figure out what the next year is going to look like. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, can you talk just really briefly a little bit about what, what the term climate justice? I know that that's sort of um, a new term for some of our supporters, and it may be brand new for some of the, um, you know, people who are coming to us from the art gallery. But um, yeah, can you help explain that concept just a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's a, when I learned the term climate justice, that sort of, it's, it was at the very beginning of my activism journey, and it totally changed how I understood this whole world. Um, I think it can be sort of contrasted with sort of the traditional sort of environmentalism, which is really about sort of protecting like, like, you know, the trees and the forests, and obviously that's important, but, and, but environmentalism can often be um, sort of at the detriment of the people that, um, that are also in, like entwined with that land. Um, and so climate, what climate justice aims to do, that sort of framework is about um, understanding that we can't have, or like, like the climate and like the humans that live in it are um, um, like um, inseparable and that we can't have uh, like climate solutions without thinking about the people that those solutions will affect and that um, everything that we do to solve climate issues should also be working to solve human rights issues um, at the same time. So that, I, I hope yeah. that that works. No, that's really wonderful. That's super helpful. Mm -hmm. Can you also give me your thoughts on how artwork can be a vehicle for this kind of change? Of course, yeah. Well, I, one of the pictures that's up on the screen right now um, is a great example of that, actually. Um, uh, one of my fellow activists, um, Ollie, they designed this mural. And um, we've been painting, we actually, uh, just today, actually, um, I wasn't able to be there, but um, uh, we painted another mural outside of a TD uh, bank branch, because um, uh, that's been funding the Line 3 pipeline, which is um, going through, oh, what is it? Michigan or so, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's like Alberta into the US. Um, and that pipeline um, is another one that needs to be stopped. And, and so we painted a mural outside of the TD bank branch because they've been funding that pipeline with millions of dollars. And um, so the, uh, for us, especially our, our um, activism is like just fully intertwined with art all the time. And you showed those wonderful photos of our social media. I'm our social media people. I'm just constantly in awe of them. They're absolutely wonderful. And um, again, they demonstrate how much art and good, powerful imagery is always sort of at the at the heart of effective activism, whether it's signs or photographs or um, this kind of thing. We often um, use postering as part of our actions. Um, we've been having fun playing around with zines, which are sort of like little informational pamphlets that are also pieces of art um, and handing those out to people. It's been, it's always you can't, I don't think you can have effective activism without good art as an accompaniment to it. It really is, it, because art is really something that grabs people's attention and evokes emotion and, and makes people understand things on a deeper level just by virtue of its existence. And so I think that, that it, it's, it, yeah, like I said, it's impossible to have good activism without good art. I totally agree. <laughs> Um, I think Flossie has often used the quote of, and I can never remember the name, it's Tony um, somebody, maybe we'll have to look it up, but it's, I think it's that the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's wonderful. Karen, can you tell me how others can get involved or support you? Absolutely. Um, if you happen to live in the Lower Mainland and you happen to be youth or you happen to know youth, of course, encourage them to join the sustainability teams, but that's probably a very small subsection of the people here. Um, so uh, I think the biggest thing is just find whatever, find what your strengths are and, and find ways that you can apply them to making the world a better place. I think that's always sort of the thing is if you feel like you don't know where you fit into the movements for justice, climate justice or otherwise, um, it's for me, especially like what I, when I sort of started in this world, um, my, like, like, I think what I said in my bio was that I'm driven by a passion for storytelling. And so I like learning to use that skill that I have of storytelling and facilitating meetings and all this stuff, like allowed me to find my place in this movement as sort of a coordinator for this group. 
Um, and, and, but if, you know, if your strength is art, obviously there's space for that. If your strength is in like analytics and data management, there's space for that. There's space for really anything. And so finding what, what you can give, um, and then being, being in that place where you feel fulfilled in, in giving something that it, like you, um, are good at, that also helps it be, be something that's fulfilling for you and gives back to you. Um, but, and then it's always, of course, then also besides taking like direct action like that, it's also about listening and just learning and like being okay with being wrong and with learning, I think is such a big part of what we need in the world right now um, to sort of get to where we need to be. Um, yeah, really just whatever you can, that's always the best way to support is in any way you can. Great, and then follow the sustainability teams on Instagram. Okay. And of course. Yeah, and what's the is your website sustainabilityteens.org? Is that right? Dot org. Yes, that is correct. Okay, great. And we'll put all those links in a follow up email, um, and we'll come back to you, Karen, when we have time for a little bit more discussion. But let's hear next from Randy, um, and I will again move through a couple of images of Randy's work. These are a couple of pieces that spoke to me. Um, I just am a huge fan of your work, Randy. <laughs> uh, I really love that you play with this sort of um, uh, juxtapositions um, of traditional artwork and contemporary artwork. And um, yeah, I love these two pieces. This was one of the first ones that I had seen, the self-portrait that you took uh, that I really loved when I learned a little bit more about your story. And uh, I wish we had time to get into it tonight, but if you haven't, uh, watched Randy's documentary. Um, it will send you the link later. It's about 20 minutes long and it's definitely worth watching. Another beautiful series of yours. And this is the piece in particular that I am hoping you'll have a little bit of time to talk about. Um, I know you're a diverse painter, sculptor, photographer, filmmaker, all of these things, um, lots of different hats or masks, <laughs> as we may want to call it. Um, can you just talk a little bit about this piece, uh, the mother tree, and how your practice as an artist intersects with your responsibility as an Indigenous title holder? Mm, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I'll just dive into it, I guess. I think you did a little bit of an intro there for me. Um, but it, it's fascinating. I mean, we're here, you know, as artists and we're looking through a very significant lens right now, I think, at the way we're starting to approach global warming. Um, there's some really big, serious questions that are around us every day. And I know speaking with many you know, different artists today, um, you know, I guess maybe the amount of weight that we carry and trying to amplify a message that we can get out to the world that is going to reach them and be meaningful and how we can create change. Um, so I just want to say thank you, Kieran, for your work. Uh, that was, you know, it was nice hearing you speak. Um, and Diving into this piece in particular, I mean, I had just finished my master's and in my program, I started to integrate science and I started to dive into a lot of the work um, Suzanne Simard is doing on tree communication. Um, and what I did was I sourced this yellow cedar from the West Coast and I did a trip out into Berry Creek and Eden and uh, through the residency, which uh, Kyle is also a part of. Um, yeah, so I was invited out by Jesse. And as I was patrol, like cruising along the logging roads there, um, I seen, you know, some fallen logs, you know, that had been cut up with some blocks that were cut out of it. So I took a piece, um, not really, you know, thinking about what I was going to do with it. I just thought, okay, there's just so much emotion right now that is happening out here. You know, I'm going to take this piece home and sit on it and just see how, you know, it speaks to me. Um, so it kind of brought me back to my culture and how we, you know, we don't really have a goal. It's through those relationships with the forest 
that we create a conversation and it's through those gifts from the forest that we you know receive the information and that's what creates ritual and ceremonies for us and it's usually in that process where you know that breath of life that you're speaking about you know comes through and it is it interconnects with us we are one with that it's this universal flow of energy that is just pulsating through this entire universe that we cannot deny as human beings that we are a part of and to think that we are separate and greater um, is completely wrong uh, especially in our philosophy as Kwakwaka'wakw people um, so when I started to work with Suzanne Samard, it was just, you know, so parallel in everything that she was talking about. But what made it so exciting for me was, you know, she was speaking to the language of science. And I started to, you know, connect with her on a level where, you know, it just became very apparent that it's very easy to relate on an international level when speaking to science. Um, and for me to express who I am as a Kwakwaka'wakw person and what our beliefs have been for tens of thousands of years in relationship to the environment, um, you know, it doesn't translate that easily. I mean, because we've got so many different layers, whether, you know, I mean, we could talk about tree communication as spirituality, you know, and then that can move into a completely different direction. Um, but I wanted to create a piece, you know, that spoke to her work. And I titled it Mother Tree actually to thank her for her work and everything that she's doing. So this is essentially just an aerial view of looking down and the face is the center of the tree. And all around it is the underground root network system. And I pushed really hard in the past few years to create a style from traditional Kwakwaka'wakw to form line to break all the rules and bend things and move them in a very poetic kind of way. And it's the way I started to see and feel my relationship with the environment, um, where I started to encompass, you know, more of uh, the fluidity that translates and comes through in emotion and through music and relationship and all of these different frequencies. So for me, I just thought if we can move it in such a way, if I can as an artist and move it where it's just, you know, becomes poetic, then it will start to pull people in and create more conversation because it's not typically the traditional style that you normally see. Um, so yeah, so it's all of that root network, you know, and all of that information and everything we talk about coming through. And it goes into the face, which I was talking about for us as Kwakwa quote, it's like the spirit of that tree. And once all of that comes together and that energy is there, it pushes and blows that breath of life up into the tree, giving it life. And that's everything that we see today. So to dismantle and cut down and kill, you know, everything that we physically see above the ground you know, in these logging practices and deforestation, you know, we don't realize exactly what it is that we're doing. It's taken, you know, a millennia to like get to this point. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of bring attention back to that in my own unique kind of way. Um, yeah, I mean, I can go on and on. So yeah, there's more. There's like, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really beautiful. And I, I didn't know that about this piece. And it makes perfect sense now that you've explained it, the, you know, physically, like it, it being almost a map in that, in that way. That's really, really cool. Um, uh, yeah, we have a few more minutes. I'd love to hear a little bit more about this Tree of Life project that you told me a little bit about in your studio. I know you guys were out in the woods. Um, you want to share a little bit of an update on what you've been doing? Yeah, yeah. So after um, graduation, after, you know, completing my master's, uh, Suzanne was a big part of my research. So I reached out to her and I thought, you know, what better way to celebrate all of that hard work than to, you know, create a field trip out into our traditional territory. So I, you know, proposed, you know, I was like, hey, would you like to, to go on a trip with me now and go and see, you know, some of our old growth and, you know, explore some of the Kwakwaka'wakw -Kwak territory? And she was like, absolutely. Um, and it grew from there. And before you know it, it was a trip between three scientists and three artists. And, 
Um, there was Rachel Holt, um, Teresa Ryan, and Suzanne Samark for scientists. And then as artists, Paul Wall, Kelly Richardson, and myself. And the idea was to get out into the environment and to look through the lens of the scientists and to explore and look at the environment um, in a completely different way um, where I could bring indigenous values and perspectives firsthand uh, with these scientists and how we you know, looked at second growth, for example, and what was happening a hundred years ago and the kind of logging and how these forests are growing today. Um, and, then, and then comparing that to the old growth forests. Um, so it was, it was fascinating. It was, it was truly amazing because um, we're also in a constant battle as, you know, First Nations people here, you know, everywhere in Canada, I guess you can say, but, you know, we're losing so much of our resources right now. And, um, and I'm battling as fast as I can. I'm, I'm trying to do as much as I can as a chief because I have inherited a role that, you know, is to go and speak to the land. So I want to uphold those values because those are values that we've been hanging on to for thousands of years. It's our culture, it's our practice, it's everything. So I really want to believe in that and live it. You know, it is a part of me. So getting out and fighting for the land and speaking for it is an inherent right. Like it, it's a responsibility that I've, I've inherited. Um, and it's something I believe in, you know, that I want my children to be able to go and see these areas. Um, but the reality is, is it's being logged very fast. Um, you know, every time I go home, it's seeing more and more destruction. And I thought if I can bring a team out um, and we could start to brainstorm and collaborate and how we can amplify this message, I thought, you know, we can look through the lens of the scientists and the artists can amplify that in our own way. Um, so Kelly Richardson, who's amazing, you know, she... Um, you know, did some IMAX film. She worked also out in the Pichidat uh, territory, um, but she works digitally. And then Paul Wald works with sound. And then, you know, I'm a visual artist and through the indigenous, you know, my, my ancestry, I was trying to bring it all together. Um, but what we came across, which was really exciting was that we found many places for the mother tree project to be set up. And, you know, and Suzanne was expressing, you know, that she's going to, you know, put it through the University of British Columbia through UBC and extend and move some of the mother tree project into Montagila territory, which will allow for more research. But what we're going to do is we're going to bring youth in who are doing language programs and we're going to integrate youth learning Fakwala, our traditional language, in partnership with science and the mother tree project so they can use their traditional language in identifying how the forest is communicating and that will allow us to you know extend and push out industry for more research and then we want to continue to do more projects like that throughout many different areas so it's early steps right now but we're really you know coming up with some cool ideas and you know and I think the more we can create space for science and youth programs you know to get out um, like some of the ideas are like art residency programs even you know for artists to go and actually work with the scientists as well and some of the youth with language so yeah so lots of cool things coming up but uh Really, it's about getting out there first and really seeing what's happening and uh, trying to think and be optimistic and proactive at the same time, right? So Amazing. I'm really excited. I can't wait to hear more. And I can't uh, agree more. I, I spend way too much time on Zoom. And here we are <laughs> on Zoom talking about it, spending time outside. <laughs> um, okay, how can people see more of your work? Where should they go? Um, well, I just opened up my own gallery called Leaf Modern Gallery, and it's um, leafmodern.ca. So there's always updates on there. And it's kind of an exciting time for myself because I opened up my own gallery because it gives me a space to bring this narrative into, you know, more of an urban setting to share this message because it really is that important. 
And I've dealt with many commercial galleries for a long time. And, um, you know, there's always that limit to, you know, how far your message can go. But uh, the idea is hopefully that I can create, um, you know, a space in our traditional territories for artists to go and work and then create an art residency and then have a space where I can actually show the work too in the city and then amplify that again, more of a message, but connecting people back, you know, to these spaces and then hopefully it can grow from there. So, yeah. Great. So leafmodern.ca and um, you can find the address to the new gallery in Rock Bay there. Um, thanks, Randy. So next we will go to Kyle and I will also show um, some of Kyle's work before I ask you a few questions. This is a portrait that someone took of you in the Eating Grove Artist Residency uh, program recently. I don't know, I don't know if this is one that was from that or not, but this piece really, really spoke to me and I just absolutely love your um, color aesthetic. This is a detail from the same painting. And so they're quite large, um, just so that you get a sense of, of scale with, with this little detail. This is an uber detail of a piece that I'll show on the next screen and ask you to speak to. And I just absolutely love these colors, Kyle, your palette, top notch. Um, so maybe you can talk uh, a little bit about your work and the artist uh, uh, Eden Grove artist residency program that you just got back from. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction there and for showing some slides. And of course, thank you to Kieran and Randy for talking. It's interesting listening to people talk for the first time and realizing that you have more uh, crossover than you thought, like especially listening to Randy talk about Suzanne Samard and she's influenced my work incredibly and Paul Stamets and Peter Holbein and this notion of of uh, science working its way into the landscape. How does, how does nature communicate with itself and how is that maybe parallel to us as human beings on this earth? So uh, really great to listen to the conversation so far. Um, and really that's kind of where my work is grounded. I, I guess I think of myself as a nomad. I've lived in lots of different places all around the world with the intention of really kind of steeping myself in nature to try and find ways in which I am not so dissimilar from the trees that are around me and the, the network, the communication happening between different plants and, and the animals and human beings that might cohabitate those places. Um, which is how I ended up at the Ferry Creek uh, Eating Grove Artist and Residency Program. Um, I completed a couple of other residencies shortly after I graduated my master's degree. One was in the Black Forest in Germany uh, and it was admittedly fairly unsatisfying as it was very much so new growth there. Didn't quite have the, the communication and underlying sensory information that I was looking for. Um, so I ended up uh, uh, with the Georgian Bay Land Trust where I was the artist in residence for just about a year and spent a lot of time really submerged in the landscape there, um, looking to find ways to bring some of those narratives from the land into my paintings. Um, and then I moved to uh, Vancouver Island and was really confronted with destruction, honestly. I I'd obviously I heard it a lot about um, logging industry practices and seen uh, the causes of that from my time traveling um, around the lower mainland. But moving to, to the island was the first time that I was completely submerged in, in honestly the horror that can be some of those barren landscapes and, and, and the fires and everything that comes with it. So um, Jeremy Herndl was the painter that actually invited me to go out to Eden Grove with him to start participating in the residency. And uh, I, I knew that right away I needed to spend a lot of time there. I think that a big part of my practice is again that that lived experience that comes with getting to know the piece of land for a long period of time and I felt so grateful to be able to have um, the invitation of Elder Bill Jones from Pachidot First Nation there to come and uh, see what happened in that time out on the land. Um, 
So in this, this painting in particular that's on the screen here with the detail and the full painting uh, on the left there, it's, it's about six and a half feet tall, that painting. So it's quite a large thing. Um, and the intention of that was to exaggerate the, the scale of the trees, even though I think they probably could be bigger. Well, also relying on some of those lessons that I learned about um, mycorrhizal networks and, and communication between plants, trying to replicate that in, in those barren nerve-like tips to those candelabra trees at the top there. Um, but I also find that incrementally, as the output of these paintings becomes urban environments. Like I, I paint them in the woods and I'm very lucky to have opportunities for people to see them where they're made. But at the end of the day, I find that this work ends up in, in the city. Um, so using them as a vehicle to bring that message to urban centers of um, logging practices and the, the real repercussions of the climate crisis that we're facing, uh, that's something that I'm trying to really lean into right now in my work. So instead of just painting a barren, mountainside, I find now that it's become a really useful visual tool to paint cut logs as though they're cut by machines for industry with those really clean cut stumps across the top and setting up that juxtaposition between um, the really energetic, colorful, lively, dense areas of forest that we still have left right next to those really uh, unnatural looking processed pieces of wood, unfortunately, at that point. Um, so yeah, that's where that painting came from. And then trying to take that one step further by showing the figure in the center, making a painting with the same composition, but in this instance, all the trees are unfortunately on fire. Um, so maybe Very the figure is looking into the future or something. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but, uh, but yeah, definitely representing a reality that is even one step further beyond the climate crisis that we're currently all experiencing. Yeah, and for those of us in the interior <laughs> that are currently experiencing, right? It's, uh, yeah. The wildfires are really intense. I really find it fascinating because the color palette speaks to me and the overall sort of like quality and energy of the painting has a sort of like sereneness that would just bring you in in a commercial gallery, right? And then what you actually are painting on the canvas is definitely not what you would see <laughs> in a right. typical commercial gallery. I think that, that uh, there's something quite powerful about choosing to paint something aesthetically in a beautiful way that communicates something quite different. Yeah, I think in, in part for me as the, as the maker, there's a longing for um, that moment of, of being submerged in, in the woods or the, in the landscape and, and the awe that can be associated with that when you kind of give your body over to the experience um, and how beautiful that can be and, and, and powerful that can be emotionally or for your thought process or for carrying that forward into the next days that you might be back in your regular life or wherever you might go. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to paint the woods in, in a way that exaggerates that and I know that in doing so it's likely making it more digestible or, or more inviting for somebody to to read on a surface level maybe it's going to be more eye-catching if somebody's coming into a gallery space or um, a space to view artwork like this even if it's online in a zoom meeting like this at a, at a glance they might be attracted to the colors like you just pointed out yourself think that it's really inviting to look at but there's a bit of a trick that happens that once I've got somebody's eye for longer than that just first moment, they start to delve into what the actual content of the painting is, then that's when some of those um, unfortunate moments of, of climate destruction become apparent to the viewer. And I, I guess in, in those moments, that's where I'm, I'm hoping that there can be some, uh, some mechanism of change or some new thought that can be given to people in these urban environments to try and influence their behavior or to open their eyes to some of the things that are happening out in these remote areas. Like uh, Pachidot First Nation uh, at the site of the Eden Grove Artisan Residence Program is, I think it's about 60 kilometers from the first bar of cell service. It's not a very accessible place um, to most people. 
but uh, to to have the opportunity to bring the reality of the circumstance there with the guidance and the support of the community on the ground there, um, of the people who have really made something special out of that that place in in support of advocacy and amplifying the message of, of the Peshidat First Nations who are fighting for their territory right now. Um, I, uh, I think it's, it's useful to just try and get that message out as far as we possibly can. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know, so the um, Eden Grove Artist in Residence program that both Randy and Kyle were involved in um, is sort of like loosely affiliated with the Ferry Creek blockades on southwestern Vancouver Island where Pechadat territory is. Um, and so this program is obviously um, an opportunity to draw attention to what's going on at the blockades and, and in the woods, um, just in case anybody didn't know. I think we may have made some assumptions about that program. Um, so before I get into, you know, opening it up completely, how can others learn more about your work? Where can we find you? Uh, well, right now I've got a couple things in the cooker that I'm unfortunately not quite ready to share yet. I'm having meetings all day today about these things that I'm very excited about. So for now, really, my Instagram is the best place to keep up to date as I'll be um, try to keep pretty regular about keeping people up to date on where I am and what I'm doing. Uh, but for now, the best place really is um, at the Fortune Gallery in, in Victoria. Um, if you are on the island, going and seeing the show that is a culmination of uh, several different artists who made work around or at or in, in inspiration of the Eden Grove Artist in Residency opportunity, including Randy. Um, so yeah, that'd be the spot. Fantastic. Uh, okay, well, I want to, um, I should open up the um, chat panel here just to make sure that I'm not missing any uh, questions that were um, being posed to all of you. Um, but one of the things that I did want to ask is, a, I guess it's a bit of a theoretical question, but I'm hoping that some of you will be inspired to speak to this. What do you think that forests can teach us about art? And what do you think art can teach us about forests? Does anybody feel inspired by that question? Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's such a big question. I mean, I'm coming from, you know, a Kwakwa Kilo perspective where, you know, we, we've been in such, you know, close relationship with, you know, forests and trees. And I, I think the only thing that comes to mind for me is it's a story. And it's about the process of creation. And when an artist is searching for something, they would go and rest their forehead against a tree and breathe life into the tree and ask for the tree to breathe life back into them. And that breath of life that came back into them would fill them, their senses, their mind, everything, centering them in such a way where it was almost a direct translation as... Uh, it were a message from God or anywhere else. And when we say we're channeling something as artists and it's coming through us and we create it and we don't know where it's coming from, it's just something like we're that vessel. It's the same connection. And that's what makes trees and that connection to our forest so amazing um, for us as public folk because it was that simple, as we say, like that breath of life that would just fill us in our spirits and we would go and we would take that energy and, you know, and we would be able to create. Beautiful, thank you. Anyone else feel inspired? Yeah, I can say something uh, to that too. Um, I think that uh, there are a lot of people that are working on ways to, to live in symbiosis with the land in new and inventive contemporary kind of mechanisms um, that we're kind of learning on the fly as a, as a civilization and as a human race here, as a, 
the climate can turn, continues to turn past anything that we would ever expect. Um, and I, I just came from a, a different residency actually at the Harvest Moon Learning Center in southwestern Manitoba, where a group of experimental organic farmers are living, trying to find ways to to dream up new ways of of, of making farming practices more sustainable because we all need to eat somehow and we also need to care for the land. Um, and I found it incredibly inspiring for myself to take painting into this area, especially painting that I just made in the old growth forest around Eden Grove to this uh, uh, prairie location. And um, to see how excited people got when they realized that the networks that they were trying to build in their prairie farming communities were not so dissimilar than some of that shared connection that was happening um, in old growth forests and it's been happening for, for centuries. Uh, and the way that that connection was made was through talking about art, through this kind of tangential way of thinking about the land, by, by talking about the land in terms of color and, and maybe dreaming dream spaces or fantastical spaces or or looking at things that our eyes can't necessarily see but in in art making we can we can perceive things to be all kinds of different uh fantastical things that reference that symbiosis so um i think that for for especially for people that are acting in the spirit of being a steward of the land to to have access to art making that is trying to represent ecology in particular in um in ways that that are referential of that lived experience. I think that that conversation, that back and forth is so generative for new ways of thinking about all these problems that we're facing. And uh, I feel lucky that I've just dipped my toe in the water for being able to share that. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Karen, did you have anything you'd like to add? I, I feel like Randy and Kyle said, just such wonderful things but i i think all i'll add is like that that idea of connection that is i it's something that i was we're learning more and more like forests are full of that connection and i think it's really reflected like art is a way that that's reflected in in humanity is the that that in, like interconnectedness of of everything in the world and um it's it's just such an incredible thing to see how that connection is sort of ubiquitous throughout, whether it's forests or just ecosystems and, and through humanity, that sort of like how everything is always connected and art is like Kyle was just saying, like it, it's sort of this connection between all of those things. And yeah, what a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, for me, art is really a social thing. So like when I went to art school, um, I did a lot of volunteering as the painting and drawing students association. And like, you know, we basically wanted to have parties like, um, and, and we wanted to, sh you know, share the work that we were doing. And, um, you know, so it turned into this thing where we would be renting spaces and, and showing art and inviting our friends from the Jazz Students Association to perform and, and the poetry students to, you know, bring spoken word. And really it was like the, the creation process is one thing, which is quite deeply personal, but the like shared experience of looking at art and talking about art and being able to engage on uh, a deeper level as this like community thing. Um, I really feel like that's one of the biggest strengths that art and artists can bring is that, um, you know, when we talk about climate change and, uh, some of these issues, they're really hard and people feel quite isolated and there's a lot of climate grief. And so finding ways to <laughs> open that space up and have like, you know, joy and celebration and communication and space to, um, to find hope, I think is, it's really critical. I guess that's another really good question that I did want to ask. Um, and then we have a little bit more time. So what gives you hope? Who wants to tackle that one? I can, I can take a stab at it. Um, it, uh, yeah, this is such a difficult question always, but it's also one of the most important questions. Um, and it, it's, I, I always have a really sort of broad answer because there's so many things really that give me hope, honestly, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, and I think what gives me 
the most hope is just knowing that there's people like all of you out in the world, you know, like that there's so much dialogue and the search for understanding and, um, you know, justice and, and um, connection through art and through activism and through, um, you know, so many, it's just, it's just an incredible thing to know that like, despite how crazy and messed up the world is sometimes that we have so many wonderful people who are all working to make it better and like regardless of what happens in the world i'm always sort of reassured by the fact that i know that all of you are here and you know my activists um the people that i like, that i work with on a daily basis and it's just knowing that we that, that there's this community of people and that that's always happening like just gives me endless hope because I know that we're never going to stop fighting for the trees or for each other. And um, yeah, there's nothing better than that, really. Thank you. Randy or Kyle, would you like to share? Yeah, I can say something to that too, that really feels just like uh, piggybacking on what Kieran just said there um, is just that that community and that network of, of people out there who are like-minded in this way and and have a, I, I like to think certainly a realistic, even though it might be scary sometimes, opinion and, and viewpoint on how some of these things operate. Um, when I first went to Eden Grove to participate in the residency, I was generally a little bit scared. You know, I spent a lot of time in the woods alone, but I'd never been to an active blockade before where there is active RCMP presence and aggressive industry members around all the time. And uh, that was a little bit scary. Um, but I went there with the intention of learning from the land as a guest and a student there. And very quickly, I realized that the thing that was gonna keep me there and was gonna keep me coming back was that exactly that, that community of like-minded people all on the same team, all fighting for the same thing in a really passionate, informed way. Um, and uh, that's, that's why they ended up working their way into the paintings, all the many different folks that I met out there. And I just feel so inspired by, by knowing that there now is this group of people that I can reach out to at any time and, and continue that conversation with, continue to think of inventive ways to help, to amplify the messages of the people on the ground. And uh, even though it may seem daunting sometimes, I feel like there's a lot of change that can be made in that. Thank you. Andy? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I uh, agree with both Kyle and Kieran. Thank you for your beautiful, well-spoken words. Um, it definitely is about growing a community, you know, and I think for myself as being Kwakwa you know, we've been separated from our land for so long and my goal is just to try and get back to the land to get my family and children back to the land because it's it's healing and I think all of us in our own way are all wanting to heal and connect and we're all speaking the same language and I think that's the beauty of today and all of this and everybody coming together is that we're putting everything aside right now and we're putting the planet first and that's how it should be you know, it, it should be that way always. I mean, we are all unified, you know, there shouldn't be anything other than just us living as one and the planet. You know, we can celebrate our diversity in, in its own way and cultures and languages and art forms and all of that. And that's what makes us beautiful. But really, we have to put our energy back into the planet and make sure that we're looking after it. And I just find it's amazing today hearing and seeing so many different people from all over the world actually reaching out to us here in British Columbia. So whoever is tuned in from wherever, you know, supporting us right now, you know, thank you, because it really is needed. And, you know, and I'm not saying this just as a First Nations person of British Columbia, I'm actually saying this just as a person who actually really cares and knowing that this land now does belong to all of us, you know, like it is a responsibility and we all need to work together and looking after it and protecting it. I just feel like we're out of time now to start, you know, to think about any other sort of division in any other way. 
And yeah, so everybody that's speaking the same language, you know, and caring and reaching out, I just continuously say thank you. And thanks for having my back when I need you. And just know I'll always have yours too. That's really beautiful. Thank you. I personally always get hope when I see um, like a flower or something that's like poking out through the concrete. Like nature is so resilient <laughs> and we're so lucky at how uh, forgiving um, it can be. And uh, yeah, that's what, that's what gives me hope is when I, I see those little things poking through the cracks. So I think we are at time this evening. Um, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you, Flossie, for coming in at the last second and making sure that we had everything running smoothly um, in the background. I, I really do hope that all of you will take the time. I think I put together, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, I put together a couple of um, links that, uh, Oops, how do I get to the next screen here? Yeah, here's some links to the different um, things that we talked about tonight, the Couch and Gallery, the Sierra Club, Sustainability Teams, uh, randycook.ca, kylesherman.com, and invitetoaction.ca, which is Sierra Club's um, uh, engagement uh, portal. So um, yeah, I hope that uh, all of you do get a chance to check out some of those links. Thank you so much for um, joining us this evening. Uh, and thanks to the Cowich and Public Art Gallery uh, for supporting us in, in creating this event. Both of us are registered charities and uh, I encourage you to become a member of Sierra Club BC or the Cowich and Public Art Gallery if you're able. And we will uh, follow up with a, an email and you'll get the link to this recording. Uh, maybe give us a day or two to get that out to you. But thanks again for joining us. Really, really appreciate it and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you both so much for such a wonderful conversation. That was really wonderful to hear from you.